My Inventions, My First Efforts at Invention by Nikola Tesla. This article was published in Electrical Experimenter, March 1919. Boys will be boys the world over. The boy Tesla was no exception to the universal rule, as this, his second autobiographical article, clearly proves. As Mr. Tesla, in his own inimitable, delightful way, here paints with a literary artist's brush his own intimate boyhood in charming as well as vivid colors. We have often heard of Tesla the dreamer, but if he is entitled to the epithet, his early boyhood certainly fails to reveal it. Tesla did not allow much grass to grow under his feet while a boy, for he assuredly was a strenuous, red-blooded youngster. You will wish to read all about the greatest inventor's early boyhood. It is doubly valuable because it comes from his own pen. We promise you an interesting 20 minutes entertainment. Editor I shall dwell briefly on these extraordinary experiences on the account of their possible interest to students of psychology and physiology, and also because this period of agony was of the greatest consequence on my mental development and subsequent labors but it is indispensable to first relate the circumstances and conditions which preceded them and in which might be found their partial explanation from childhood i was compelled to concentrate attention upon myself this caused me much suffering but to my present view it was a blessing in disguise for it has taught me to appreciate the inestimable value of introspection in the preservation of life as well as a means of achievement. The pressure of occupation and the incessant stream of impressions pouring into our consciousness through all the gateways of knowledge make modern existence hazardous in many ways. Most persons are so absorbed in the contemplation of the outside world that they are wholly oblivious to what is passing on within themselves. The premature death of millions is primarily traceable to this cause. Even among those who exercise care, it is a common mistake to avoid imaginary and ignore the real dangers. And what is true of an individual also applies, more or less, to a people as a whole. Witness and illustration the prohibition movement. A drastic, if not unconstitutional measure is now being put through in this country to prevent the consumption of alcohol, and yet, it is a positive fact that coffee, tea, tobacco, chewing gum, and other stimulants which are freely indulged in, even at the tender age, are vastly more injurious to the national body, judging from the number of those who succumb. So, for instance, during my student years I gathered from the published necrologues in Vienna, the home of coffee drinkers, that deaths from heart trouble sometimes reached 67% of the total. Similar observations might probably be made in cities where the consumption of tea is excessive. These delicious beverages super excite and gradually exhaust the fine fibers of the brain. They also interfere seriously with arterial circulation and should be enjoyed all the more sparingly as their deleterious effects are slow and imperceptible. Tobacco, on the other hand, is conducive to easy and pleasant thinking, and detracts from the intensity and concentration necessary to all original and vigorous effort of the intellect. Chewing gum is helpful for a short while, but soon drains the glandular system and inflicts irreparable damage, not to speak of the revulsion it creates. Alcohol in small quantities is an excellent tonic but is toxic in its action when absorbed in larger amounts, quite immaterial as to whether it is taken in as whiskey or produced in the stomach from sugar. But it should not be overlooked that all these are great eliminators assisting nature as they do in upholding her stern but just law of survival of the fittest. Eager reformers should also be mindful of the eternal perversity of mankind, which makes the indifferent laissez-faire, by far preferable to enforced restraint. 
The truth about this is that we need stimulants to do our best work under present living conditions, and that we must exercise moderation and control our appetites and inclinations in every direction. That is what I have been doing for many years, in this way maintaining myself young in body and mind. Abstinence was not always to my liking, but I find ample reward in the agreeable experiences I am now making. Just in the hope of converting some to my precepts and convictions, I will recall one or two. A short time ago, I was returning to my hotel. It was a bitter cold night, the ground slippery and no taxi to be had. Half a block behind me followed another man, evidently as anxious as myself to get under cover. Suddenly, my legs went up in the air. In the same instant there was a flash in my brain, the nerves responded, the muscles contracted, I swung through 180 degrees and landed on my hands. I resumed my walk as though nothing had happened when the stranger caught up with me. How old are you? he asked, surveying me critically. Oh, about 59, I replied. What of it? Well, said he, I have seen a cat do this, but never a man. About a month since, I wanted to order new eyeglasses and went to an oculist who put me through the usual tests. He looked at me incredulously as I read off with ease the smallest print at considerable distance. But when I told him that I was past sixty, he gasped in astonishment. Friends of mine often remark that my suits fit me like gloves but they do not know that all my clothing is made to measurements which were taken nearly thirty-five years ago and never changed. During this same period my weight has not varied one pound. In this connection I may tell a funny story. One evening, in the winter of 1885, Mr. Edison, Edward H. Johnson, the president of the Edison Illuminating Company, Mr. Batchelor, manager of the works, and myself entered a little place opposite 65 Fifth Avenue, where the offices of the company were located. Someone suggested guessing weights, and I was induced to step on a scale. Edison felt me all over and said, Tesla weighs 152 pounds to an ounce, and he guessed it exactly. Stripped, I weighed 142 pounds, and that is still my weight. I whispered to Mr. Johnson, How is it possible that Edison could guess my weight so closely? Well, he said, lowering his voice, I will tell you, confidentially, but you must not say anything. He was employed for a long time in a Chicago slaughterhouse, where he weighed thousands of hogs every day, that's why. My friend, the Honorable Chauncey M. Depew, tells of an Englishman on whom he sprung one of his original anecdotes, and who listened with puzzled expression, but, a year later, laughed out loud. I will frankly confess it took me longer than that to appreciate Johnson's joke. Now, my well-being is simply the result of a careful and measured mode of living, and perhaps the most astonishing thing is that, three times in my youth, I was rendered by illness a hopeless physical wreck, and given up by physicians. More than this, through ignorance and light-heartedness, I got into all sorts of difficulties, dangers, and scrapes from which I extricated myself as by enchantment. I was almost drowned a dozen times, was nearly boiled alive, and just missed being cremated. I was entombed, lost, and frozen. I had hair-breadth escapes from mad dogs, hogs, and other wild animals. I passed through dreadful diseases, all kinds of odd mishaps and that I am hale and hearty today seems like a miracle. But as I recall these incidents to my mind, I feel convinced that my preservation was not altogether accidental. An inventor's endeavor is essentially life-saving. Whether he harnesses forces, improves devices, or provides new comforts and conveniences, he is adding to the safety of our existence. He is also better qualified than the average individual to protect himself in peril for he is observant and resourceful. If I had no other evidence that I was, in a measure, possessed of such qualities, I would find it in these personal experiences. 
the reader will be able to judge for himself if i mention one or two instances on one occasion when i was about fourteen years old i wanted to scare some friends who were bathing with me my plan was to dive under a long floating structure and slip out quietly at the other end swimming and diving came to me as naturally as to a duck and i was confident that i could perform the feat accordingly i plunged into the water and when out of view turned around and proceeded rapidly towards the opposite side thinking that i was safely beyond the structure i rose to the surface but to my dismay struck a beam of course i quickly dived and forged ahead with rapid strokes until my breath was beginning to give out rising for the second time my head came again in contact with a beam now i was becoming desperate however summoning all my energy i made a third frantic attempt but the result was the same the torture of suppressed breathing was getting unendurable my brain was reeling and i felt myself sinking at that moment when my situation seemed absolutely hopeless i experienced one of those flashes of light and the structure above me appeared before my vision i either discerned or guessed that there was little space between the surface of the water and the boards resting on the beams and with consciousness nearly gone i floated up pressed my mouth close to the planks and managed to inhale a little air unfortunately mingled with a spray of water which nearly choked me several times i repeated this procedure as in a dream until my heart which was racing at a terrible rate quieted down and i gained composure after that i made a number of unsuccessful dives having completely lost the sense of direction but finally succeeded in getting out of the trap when my friends had already given me up and were fishing for my body that bathing season was spoiled for me through recklessness but i soon forgot the lesson and only two years later i fell into a worse predicament there was a large flour mill with a dam across the river near the city where i was studying at the time as a rule the height of the water was only two or three inches above the dam and to swim out to it was a sport not very dangerous in which i often indulged one day i went alone to the river to enjoy myself as usual when i was a short distance from the masonry however i was horrified to observe that the water had risen and was carrying me along swiftly i tried to get away but it was too late luckily though i saved myself from being swept over by taking hold of the wall with both hands the pressure against my chest was great and i was barely able to keep my head above the surface not a soul was in sight and my voice was lost in the roar of the fall slowly and gradually i became exhausted and unable to withstand the strain longer just as i was about to let go to be dashed against the rocks below i saw in a flash of light a familiar diagram illustrating the hydraulic principle that the pressure of a fluid in motion is proportionate to the area exposed and automatically i turned on my left side as if by magic the pressure was reduced and i found it comparatively easy in that position to resist the force of the stream but the danger still confronted me i knew that sooner or later i would be carried down as it was not possible for any help to reach me in time even if i attracted attention i am ambidextrous now but then i was left-handed and had comparatively little strength in my right arm for this reason i did not dare to turn on the other side to rest and nothing remained but to slowly push my body along the dam i had to get away from the mill towards which my face was turned as the current there was much swifter and deeper it was a long and painful ordeal and i came near to failing at its very end for i was confronted with a depression in the masonry i managed to get over with the last ounce of my force and fell in a swoon when i reached the bank where i was found i had torn virtually all the skin from my left side and it took several weeks before the fever subsided and i was well these are only two of many instances but they may be sufficient to show that had it not been for the inventor's instinct i would not have lived to tell this tale interested people have often asked me how and when i began to invent this i can only answer from my present recollection in the light of which the first attempt i recall was rather ambitious for it involved the invention of an apparatus and a method in the former i was anticipated 
but the latter was original. It happened in this way. One of my playmates had come to the possession of a hook and fishing tackle, which created quite an excitement in the village, and the next morning all started out to catch frogs. I was left alone and deserted owing to a quarrel with this boy. I had never seen a real hook and pictured it as something wonderful, endowed with peculiar qualities, and was despairing not to be one of the party. Urged by necessity, I somehow got hold of a piece of soft iron wire, hammered the end into a sharp point between two stones, bent it into shape, and fastened it to a strong string. Then I cut a rod, gathered some bait, and went down to the brook where there were frogs in abundance. But I could not catch any and was almost discouraged when it occurred to me to dangle the empty hook in front of a frog sitting on a stump. At first he collapsed, but by and by his eyes bulged out and became bloodshot. He swelled to twice his normal size and made a vicious snap at the hook. Immediately I pulled him up. I tried the same thing again and again, and the method proved infallible. When my comrades, who in spite of their fine outfit had caught nothing, came to me, they were green with envy. For a long time I kept my secret and enjoyed the monopoly, but finally yielded to the spirit of Christmas. Every boy could then do the same, and the following summer brought disaster to the frogs. In my next attempt, I seem to have acted under the first instinctive impulse which later dominated me to harness the energies of nature to the service of man. I did this through the medium of maybugs, or june bugs as they are called in America, which were a veritable pest in the country, and sometimes broke the branches of trees by the sheer weight of their bodies. The bushes were black with them. I would attach as many as four of them to a cross piece, rotably arranged on a thin spindle, and transmit the motion of the same to a larger disc and so derive considerable power. These creatures were remarkably efficient, for once they were started they had no sense to stop and continued whirling for hours and hours, and the hotter it was, the harder they worked. All went well until a strange boy came to the place. He was the son of a retired officer in the Austrian army. That urchin ate maybugs alive and enjoyed them as though they were the finest blue point oysters. That disgusting sight terminated my endeavors in this promising field, and I have never since been able to touch a maybug or any other insect for that matter. After that, I believe, I undertook to take apart and assemble the clocks of my grandfather. In the former operation, I was always successful, but often failed to the latter. So it came that he brought my work to a sudden halt in a matter not too delicate and it took thirty years before I tackled another clockwork again. Shortly thereafter, I went into the manufacture of a kind of pop gun which comprised a hollow tube, a piston, and two plugs of hemp. When firing the gun, the piston was pressed against the stomach, and the tube was pushed back quickly with both hands. The air between the plugs was compressed and raised to high temperature, and one of them was expelled with a loud report. The art consisted in selecting a tube of the proper taper from the hollow stalks. I did very well with that gun, but my activities interfered with the window panes in our household and met with painful discouragement. If I remember rightly, I then took to carving swords from pieces of furniture which I could conveniently obtain. At that time I was under the sway of the Serbian national poetry and full of admiration for the feats of the heroes. I used to spend hours in mowing down my enemies in the form of corn stalks, which ruined the crops and netted me several spankings from my mother. Moreover, these were not of the formal kind, but the genuine article. I had all this and more behind me before I was six years old and had passed through one year of elementary school in the village of Similjan where I was born. At this juncture we moved to the little city of Gospic nearby. This change of residence was like a calamity to me. It almost broke my heart to part from our pigeons, chickens, and sheep, and our magnificent flock of geese which used to rise to the clouds in the morning and return from the feeding grounds at sundown in battle formation, so perfect that it would have put a squadron of the very best aviators of the present day to shame. In our new house I was but a prisoner, watching the strange people I saw through the window blinds. 
my bashfulness was such that i would rather have faced a roaring lion than one of the city dudes who strolled about but my hardest trial came on sunday when i had to dress up and attend the service there i meet with an accident the mere thought of which made my blood curdle like sour milk for years afterwards it was my second adventure in a church not long before i was entombed for a night in an old chapel on an inaccessible mountain which was visited only once a year it was an awful experience but this one was worse there was a wealthy lady in town a good but pompous woman who used to come to church gorgeously painted up and attired with an enormous train and attendants one sunday i had just finished ringing the bell in the belfry and rushed downstairs when this grand dame was sweeping out and i jumped on her train it tore off with a ripping noise which sounded like a salvo of musketry fired by raw recruits my father was livid with rage he gave me a gentle slap on the cheek the only corporal punishment he ever administered to me but i almost feel it now the embarrassment and confusion that followed are indescribable i was practically ostracized until something else happened that redeemed me in the estimation of the community an enterprising young merchant had organized a fire department a new fire engine was purchased uniforms provided and men drilled for service and parade the engine was in reality a pump to be worked by sixteen men and was beautifully painted red and black one afternoon the official trial was prepared for and the machine was transported to the river the entire population turned out to witness the great spectacle when all the speeches and ceremonies were concluded the command was given to pump but not a drop of water came from the nozzle the professors and experts tried in vain to locate the trouble the fizzle was complete when i arrived at the scene my knowledge of the mechanism was nil and i knew next to nothing of air pressure but instinctively i felt for the suction hose in the water and found that it had collapsed when i waded in the river and opened it up the water rushed forth and not a few sunday clothes were spoiled archimedes running naked through the streets of syracuse and shouting eureka at the top of his voice did not make a greater impression than myself i was carried on the shoulders and was the hero of the day upon settling in the city i began a four years course in the so-called normal school preparatory to my studies at the college or real gymnasium during this period my boyish efforts and exploits as well as troubles continued among other things i attained the unique distinction of champion crow catcher in the country my method of procedure was extremely simple i would go in the forest hide in the bushes and imitate the call of the bird usually i would get several answers and in a short while a crow would flutter down into the shrubbery near me after that all i needed to do was to throw a piece of cardboard to distract its attention jump up and grab it before it could extricate itself from the undergrowth in this way i could capture as many as i desired but on one occasion something occurred which made me respect them i had caught a fine pair of birds and was returning home with a friend when we left the forest thousands of crows had gathered making a frightful racket in a few minutes they rose in pursuit and soon enveloped us the fun lasted until all of a sudden i received a blow on the back of my head which knocked me down then they attacked me viciously i was compelled to release the two birds and was glad to join my friend who had taken refuge in a cave in the schoolroom there were a few mechanical models which interested me and turned my attention to water turbines i constructed many of these and found great pleasure in operating them how extraordinary was my life an incident may illustrate my uncle had no use for this kind of pastime and more than once rebuked me i was fascinated by a description of niagara falls i had perused and pictured in my imagination a big wheel run by the falls i told my uncle that i would go to america and carry out this scheme thirty years later i saw my ideas carried out at niagara and marvelled at the unfathomable mystery of the mind 
I made all kinds of other contrivances and contraptions, but among these the arbalists I produced were the best. My arrows, when shot, disappeared from sight, and at close range traversed a plank of pine one inch thick. Through the continuous tightening of the bows I developed skin on my stomach very much like that of a crocodile, and I am often wondering whether it is due to this exercise that I am able even now to digest cobblestones. Nor can I pass in silence my performances with the sling, which would have enabled me to give a stunning exhibit at the Hippodrome. And now I will tell of one of my feats with this antique implement of war, which will strain to the utmost the credulity of the reader. I was practicing while walking with my uncle along the river. The sun was setting, the trout were playful, and from time to time one would shoot up into the air its glistening body sharply defined against the projecting rock beyond. Of course, any boy might have hit a fish under these proprietous conditions, but I undertook a much more difficult task, and I foretold to my uncle, to the minutest detail, what I intended doing. I was to hurl a stone to meet the fish, press its body against the rock, and cut it in two. It was no sooner said than done. My uncle looked at me, almost scared out of his wits, and exclaimed, Vade retro Satanas! And it was a few days before he spoke to me again. Other records, however great, will be eclipsed, but I feel that I could peacefully rest on my laurels for a thousand years. <laughs>